You're listening to The Minor Detail Podcast, a place where all things community, encouragement, and lifestyle come together through meaningful conversation. I'm your host, Kyla Ariel, and I'm so grateful that you chose to join me on this journey of authenticity to serve as a link that amplifies human connection in our everyday lives. Navigating life on a daily basis can be difficult, but I am confident that together will be our own answer to life's minor little details that come our way. Sit back and enjoy today's episode purposely curated just for you. Hey y'all, and welcome back to the Minor Detail Podcast. I'm your host, Kyla Ariel, and as I always say, because I truly do mean it, I am so grateful that you are here listening today. I am also super excited for y'all to tune into this conversation. Truthfully, I have been anticipating this all day. I'm not sure if I've had a guest on the pod like this before, and so I'm just really excited to introduce her to you all um, and for you to learn what she's doing in the community because she is literally doing some amazing amazing things, which we'll get to, okay? Joining us today is Kristen Wells-Lewis. Kristen is the founder of Black to the Lab, an educational learning toy designed to expose young girls to science, tech, engineering, and math, as well as STEM's unique impact on the cosmetic industry. Kristen is also a content creator and founder of her very own creative agency, Her Hyphen. Girl, what don't you do? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really, really, really excited. I literally have been thinking about this all day. Um, just really excited to get connected with women who are really, you know, sharing the stories about the work that we get a chance to do. Um, and it just feels so good. So I don't do everything, but I do a little bit of, you know, some something. Um, I, I really pride myself on being a creative first. Um, I think that just having that creative gene is what really allowed me to be courageous in all that I do, like to try things, figure it out. But it also makes a little bit of all of the things that I dabble in truly unique because I always put like my creative spin on it because I want people to experience what I'm experiencing as I'm creating it. So that's how, you know, how I got here, how Black to the Lab was born. Um, And I hope to share that same gift with other small Black business owners and other business owners who are, you know, getting ready to tell their story through whatever it is that they're creating too. I love it. Thank you for that intro. Seriously. Um, I also, and thank you for joining the show. Number one, I like to kind of start off each show asking my guests, like, how are you feeling today? I think that's really important, you know, for us to check in on each other, of course, but also for us, it's the end of the day. So how are you? Um, I am blessed. Uh, as of late, I have been telling myself that I literally have no complaints, you know, like that, Obviously, we can think of things to complain about, but I don't have complaints. Uh, That question actually makes me so teary just because I'm really blessed to be um, in the season that I'm in. And I try to operate in that gratitude each day. So even though I'm tired, I just got from the gym. Um, (laughs) But I'm just like, you know, like I'm in the life that I have prayed for, that I have worked for. um, And I dare not, you know, like waste any moment of this season just, you know, complaining Uh, per se, but just more so being grateful and being blessed. Girl, listen, that is so good because, and I'm probably going to say that's everything you say tonight because I'm, I'm, (laughs) I realize that I say that a lot, but seriously, it is so good. I had a moment yesterday morning, I was at the gym and I felt the same thing, right? Like we are really living in our prayers. Like we want pray to be here, whatever that looks like. And especially when times get hard, Um, and we're really like hitting adversity head on. Like we truly do have to remember where we were before, um, and where we pray to be, which is where we are now, no matter what, what that looks like. So I love that you call that out specifically, because I think that that's really important. It's key. Yep. It definitely is. Um, and I think that having that, that heart posture is essential, especially like for entrepreneurs, because, you're going to always be in a head down space. Like you're working, you're working, you're working, you're building. And sometimes you do forget to look back, you know, at where you come from to where you are. And it may be like that one small thing or that minor detail that makes all of the difference, but just having that sense of gratitude is what really reminds you like, Oh, I really, I'm, I'm moving in the right direction and I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. Well, you have sort of introed us to Black to the Lab and all the amazing work that you're doing, but 
I would really love to know more specifically about like how you got your start in chemistry, like where your desire came from to create Black to the Lab. Where did that quote unquote stem from? <laughs> That's a good one. So um, I definitely think that just my nature for academics, I will say, came stem from early childhood. Like early childhood, I always like the resident academic student. Um, and it was just something that I, I was supposed to be doing. I love school. I love learning. Like I'm the kid who wants to play school, who wants to be the teacher, who carries around notebooks, pens, and papers in my little purse as a kid. Um, I've always loved learning. And so as I started to, you know, go through school, um, my teachers always kind of pushed me in that science space where they realize like, oh, you're good at this or you have a gift or we want to challenge you. And so my high school had a magnet program and it was a medical magnet program. And at the time I wanted to be a pharmacist and I actually only was able to do hospital clinical rotations because of my age. And so when I was in the hospital doing clinical rotations, like pharmacy looks a little bit different depending on the environment. Like if you're a retail pharmacist, a compounding pharmacist, hospital pharmacy. And so obviously in the hospital, they do a bit more compounding pharmacy or preparing um, IV drips and different things like that. And so that really excited me. But when I went to college, I knew that my college um, did not offer a pre-pharmacy program. And I had also been advised against a pre-pharmacy program. They were like, you know, if you change your mind, then, you know, like you may be stuck or different things like that. So I decided to major in biology and I got accepted into a program where I started college literally the day after I graduated high school. <laughs> Literally, I left. Project Wait, the day after you graduated high school? I mean, yeah. granted, it's only like two months in between for regular students, but wow. Yes. Um, and I think that that was important because it didn't give me an opportunity to like settle. It it kept me like in the mode. Um, and we I went to project graduation. I had my stuff packed already and I went to college the next day and I think in that space, I really learned to love science, but I also did struggle a bit. Um, it was challenging. I feel like school had always come very easy to me. So being in that space and being constantly challenged every single day was draining. And anybody knows if you've ever gone to summer school, summer school is a lot more fast paced than a regular semester because you only have five weeks. Um, but I just, I loved it. And I think that I love the people, like I love my classmates. I love my very first professor. Like he was always encouraging. He was funny. Um, and so it allowed me to really like explore more. But what I noticed is once I left that environment from like the group of us freshmen that came in together and this particular professor was that I really didn't have too many professors that were encouraging. And so I really started to lose desire. Um, and then also I pledged. And I like to tell this story because it's extremely important um, on outlook, like your future outlook. When I pledged, I started to learn a lot about social justice. And so I feel like my brain outside of like a classroom brain, like expanded into the worldview of academia. And I started to learn a lot about the pharmaceutical industry and big pharma and opioid crisis and all these other things and how um, the pharmaceutical industry was really like structured in this country. And at that particular moment, because I was really immersing myself into all of this social justice knowledge that I just didn't really have, but I did have the experience of, you know, like, a black person. And so it's like, you're connecting the dots of like, oh, this is why my school didn't have textbooks, or this is why we only have two hospitals, or this is why access to healthcare looks like this in my community versus this community, or why we don't have green space in my community versus this community. So as I'm learning, um, I, it does create a sense of rebellion. <laughs> so I immediately was like, you know, I don't want to be a pharmacist anymore. I know that I want to um, help people. And I had to evaluate like what I loved about the space. I want to help people. I want to create like a safe space for people. I want a space where brown and black girls can be inspired, can create and different things like that. And so while I knew I didn't want to be a pharmacist anymore, I didn't have an immediate answer for what it was that I wanted to do. Um, but I kept 
Gwen, I eventually changed my major to chemistry and minored in biology, which is just like a few class differences. But what I noticed when I changed my major to chemistry versus the biology space is the lack of representation. Um, in my graduating class, I actually think I went to an HBCU and I actually think I was the only black girl graduating in my group that graduated. And what? That, okay, yeah. pause. Let's <laughs> rewind a minute. So you went to PV. That yes, is the I HBCU. Went to you went to, okay. So you went to Prairie View and then you said you pledged and I'm thinking Delta. Delta. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I'm like, I think I saw this, but I'm not sure. Okay. So you went to BV, PV as a freshman, you get into an or enroll into chemistry and at an HBCU where you are a Delta, you're the only black female in your class. Yeah, in my graduating class. So when I graduated in 2015, there were six of us who were graduating at the time. And I think for sure that I was the only Black female chemistry major. At and, an HBCU. At an HBCU. Wow. Um, and I think like going back and because now this is going to make me go back and look at the list. Um, if I go back and look at like the other students who majored in chemistry and graduated, the numbers are similar. So maybe like three black girls. And when I say black girls, I mean like African-American black girls. Um, of course, some of our classmates were Asians, Indians, African, different things like that. Um, but I even thought about that experience and how isolating it felt. Um, and I had like my professors from the biology side, they were the ones that were always very supportive and not to say that the department wasn't supportive, but I do think that there is a cultural disconnect that people think that black people are monolithic and just the color of the skin. And there is a lot of cultural disconnect in the academic space. Um, like I remember one of my Asian professors, he brought his son to class one day and I think his son was like in the fifth grade. He's like, my son can do this. Why can't you guys do this? <laughs> um, so it's like having those little experiences is it kind of shuts you off. And so once I graduated, I was like, you know, I'm not going to let this experience deter me. Um, I noticed that I what I really wanted to do was in the public health space. So kind of going back to, like I said, some of those questions around like socioeconomic status and what's missing and how it looks uh, and how it's translated in the Black community. Um, so I started graduate school for that and I ended up changing to a community development program and that allowed me to have like a larger focus. And again, I'm starting to notice like this pattern of displacement of black girls. Like even when we talk about um, corporal punishment and like different things on how black girls are reared in the education system. So eventually I always tell people like if you go back and look at the years the stories kind of make sense like this is also the era of um the natural hair care movement like black people are really empowering themselves around a lot of knowledge as it relates to beauty makeup hair skin you see this boom of um, black businesses and black business being recognized for the things that they're creating and going into mass retail and different things like that and that is when I started to formulate and at that moment that was the first time ever in my life that this clicked that this was chemistry Oh my gosh. I love that so much. I love that so much. So it's just, it's also crazy because I feel like every time we have a podcast conversation and I have a guest on, like we always recognize that everything is connected, right? Like getting to the point of where we are now, like there was a reason we went through certain experiences. Um, also love that you had that epiphany moment, because I think those are literally the clearest moments that you'll ever have in life. And it's just such a beautiful reminder from God that, that like, it's all coming together, right. you know, it's all coming together. Like if you just trust the plan, trust the process, um, it all comes together because I did at, at one point, like very briefly, I did feel like I went to school and went through all of this and then I'm going to be way over here, but it literally all made sense and all reconnected. So when did you officially start building out Black to the Lab? I officially started building out Black to the Lab around like 2019. So at the time, I want to say 2017, 2018, I started my own um, skincare company and I was formulating different products. It was a subscription box and I was formulating different products and people were able to try these different products and they had different themes. And that was like 2018, 2019. Um, 
And then in 2019, I rebranded. But at, in 2019, on my job, I this is when I'm having the epiphany, right? That this is science. Um, cause my company, my first company was called the chemistry of, and so each subscription box would break down a different ingredient. So it would be the chemistry of lavender, the chemistry of pumpkin, and it would have like different products around these different ingredients and the science behind it. And so on my job, I was like, I'm going to try this on my job to see how kid, like if kids can connect the dots. Um, and I remember doing a cosmetic chemistry activation and we taught the girls how to make lip gloss and that day I was like I'm leaving this job like <laughs> like to see these girls uh response to it because I was wondering if you know how sometimes especially I feel like people who are in the academic space like sometimes our brain is like up here and you're like okay I need to, how can I translate it to like the average person like will the average person pick up on this and when I saw the response of those young girls um I was like I'm gonna keep going with this and that was in 2019 and so I kept running my company and I rebranded it I rebranded it to um Coco Wells because I wanted to have like a more family focus kind of soften the tone because I do feel like while the science of it is important depending on what you're creating um certain people don't want to know if that makes sense like certain people it, you, it's just like when people are telling you all these different things about like food and stuff and it's just like well can I enjoy something for myself um and so I wanted to give it a more family focus and just focus on educating people from a holistic standpoint like just raising awareness and not so much of shoving the information down people's throat but at that moment in the background was when I started to build out Black to the Lab. And I started to look at like, what are some of the key focuses? What's missing? You know, how to how to make it educational, but still make it fun. Um, and then what's most important about Black to the Lab? What makes it different? And I remember sharing it with two of my little cousins and I showed them similar products. And I asked them what was one thing that they noticed about the product. And immediately, without prompting, without any, like me telling them anything, immediately they said, I don't see no Black people. So when you look at different play sets um, that are STEM focused, very rarely you'll see an animal, a character, or um, a kid that is not Black. And that really, that was my second moment where I was like, okay, I'm on the right, like I'm going in the right place. Um, and then I just kept building, kept building, kept building. And I was very afraid to to launch it um, at the time, particularly because of the job that I was in. I was doing educational outreach uh, for Prairie View. And so I, I did not want them to take it. You know, like I didn't want like I feel like that what we did in that space was very like, oh, if it works, let's do it. And I didn't want them to feel that way about what I was doing. I wanted. Yeah. To Absolutely. And I think that, I mean, you said so much about just number one, what I, what spoke to me is just like being okay to rebrand, being okay to like throw things at the wall until they stick, being okay to like, maybe not know the full of big picture, but trying to get to the point of where you feel like, okay, I'm headed in the right direction, like you said. And another thing that you just mentioned around like, not wanting anybody to steal your idea or take your idea. Um, that's something I'm just like interested in general, because you're talking about, you know, creating this product and testing it on your cousins or, you know, the young girls, um, making lip gloss with them. And I'm just like getting to that point of like having an actual product, like something that would need to be patented or like something that people buy off the shelves. Like that's insane to me. I remember growing up and being like, you know, I want to own my own something, but like how did Macy's become Macy's, right? Like how did right. Foot Locker become Foot Locker, you know? So it's like, I don't know. Number one, I just feel like, yes, girl, you're going places. Like I can't wait this. I can't wait to just walk in Target and like grab it off the shelf. If it's Thank already there, you, you know I what I mean? Like, I yes. it. <laughs> but it's like getting to that point. I'm sure there are so many things that happen behind the scenes that like people just don't even see. You know, I think of like, Absolutely. you said uh, the subscription service. I was thinking of like Miley Teal or like Melissa R. Butler. You know what I mean? Like those yes. women. And I'm just like, I literally look at them and I'm like, wow, like you're doing the work. And that's how I feel hearing you talk. I'm like, you're doing the work, you know? 
Hey, you know what's crazy? I love both Melissa Butler and uh, Malik Till. And I notice like sometimes I'll ask people like, oh, do you like Malik Till? And I notice like the different type of women that people like. But then there's women that are doing the work. Um, and when I think of uh, Malik specifically, like just real heads down doing the work and I'm coming up for air to see if this sticks and if it doesn't I will put my head back down and start doing something else so I've always been inspired by the work that they've done in their business but also personally because it does take a lot of personal work on yourself to be okay with okay this did this didn't work but it doesn't mean that it's not a bad idea maybe it's the wrong timing maybe I'm talking to the wrong person or different things like that um and I think it's important because when we talk about mentorship um you know people feel like their mentor has to be like right here I, I should be able to call you but I feel like mentorship is deeply rooted in just like anybody that you can learn from like being able to remain a student and learn from someone and those two right there they are literally two of my biggest inspiration you can add unique Jones Gibson to the list like these are women who are out here changing the game because they are doing the work despite you know what's happening in the world around them or despite what people are saying despite what's popular um and you really have to zone into that space to be okay with creating something and it's like okay I am in love with what I created and maybe people will like it and maybe people won't but when you're creating something that's necessary and that really bridges the gap then like that's that's where the juice is because mm -hmm. I thought to myself, like, what I am doing um, with Coco Wells is great. Like, having a skincare brand is great, but this is not what I'm trying to go to market with. I'm trying to bring Black girls with me when I go. Um, and I knew that that required me to turn around and fill in the gaps of what I was missing in college and high school and different things like that in the science space to create something so that they can have their cups filled and they will go out. They'll be the ones that will create skincare brands and makeup brands and formulate for large companies and, you know, like all these things. And you have to be okay. Like your ego has to be okay with the assignment that God has on my life is for somebody else to go and do the thing. Man, I'm like, which way do we want to go? Because I just <laughs> like introduced something entirely new. Maybe I'll put a pin in that. But in terms of like you being boots on the ground, doing the work, like what does that look like for you, especially when it comes to um, like bringing Black girls with you and creating a space for Black girls to thrive, like you just mentioned, in those spaces that are like formulating um, and actually like learning and not feeling siloed. Um, and so having Black to the Lab at the forefront, again, as a product that people can buy and truly, truly learn from, not necessarily like your day to day, but yeah, what does that look like with you being in the community and like actually creating change? Oh, that's a really good question. I think it changes depending on the season, um, because right now I am in a season where it is myself. Uh, I have an assistant and then my fiance clocks in, you know, every now and then. And so it's like, we, we've gone past the product development phase and introducing the product. And so eventually, you know, of course, eventually we will continue to add new things, but just the general concept of Black to the Lab has been developed. Like we have that blueprint. And so now we spend a lot of our time really um, telling the story about, the gaps and telling the story about the disparities in STEM so that people can recognize this as a new opportunity. Um, we do school activations. So we go out and get hands on with these students so that they can experience it. Um, a lot of times people will ask me like, oh, what's the age? And I always love to share that it's a new opportunity. It's something that a 16 year old has never done before. So a 16 year old and a six year old, like they're on the same playing field at this point, at this point, because they're being introduced to something new. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is really just getting Black to the Lab's story out there, um, really connecting with our community and building those relationships with our community, which is, it's humbling because when I go to pop-ups, um, I am always like literally floored when someone's parent says, can my child take a picture with you? Uh, because in my head, I'm like, I'm just still in the crowd right now. 
but I realize that they are seeing me, you know, like as a game changer and that even if the child at that age doesn't recognize it the parent can say like oh, okay like I see what this is going to go and if I want my child to be in this space and I want to inspire my child I want my child to look and know the person who is creating this because sometimes I do forget to even say like I'm the founder I'm creator like I just go immediately into like oh Black Smell Lab is um, and then I'll go back or maybe someone on my team will say like oh and this is the founder and then the whole their whole entire distance position change is like oh word um and so that's really what we have been spending the last couple of months doing is really translating like what this product means like what it means to have a tangible item like this that it specifically addresses the needs and addresses the racial disparities in STEM for black girls but also while you're learning STEM you're getting able to create something that you resonate with we're talking about the beauty industry where black women are the top spenders, even in a worldwide pandemic, the top spenders. Um, so we are changing our minds from not just being consumers, but producers. Absolutely. And it's so, it's so insane that you mentioned that about, about black women, because, um, in like preparation for our conversation, I was just thinking about how black women are also the highest rising entrepreneur. It's like two, I think like white men's 10% and white women's 15% were like exceeding that number right now, which it sounds good. But at the same time, number one, why are we leaving corporate? That's a whole nother conversation, right? Like, why are we wanting to become entrepreneurs? But number two, just like in any space, becoming an, an entrepreneur already has its challenges. Becoming an entrepreneur as a black woman, I'm sure has even more challenges. Um, you mentioned that you were working with PV. You realized like, I got to leave this. Like I have a deeper passion to do black to the lab, to just do more. What did that, I guess, transition look like with you becoming um, an entrepreneur? And what would you say some of those challenges have been like for you in this space? Oh, yeah. So I think um, I'm a planner. So I always try to encourage people to plan. I am passion driven, but I am also very logical. <laughs> and so I feel like it made my transition a little different. Um, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I can see, um, I can see my time translate into dollars. And so at my job at the time, and, and it's also very hard, like people don't talk about when you when you leave a job that you actually love, like um, it's much easier to leave a job that's like toxic and, you know, and it's like all jobs have those pieces into them. But the work that I was doing and the being, I was still working with our community and being able to work with uh, black and brown students every day and like the impact. I was like, oh, my God, I will to leave them like, you know, some some of my kids have graduated. Some of them are at Prairie View and some of them have not graduated. And so it's just like this big ball of emotions. But I will say that I try to really plan accordingly. And this is really just like a blessing from God that uh, my fiance, when I came into this engagement, my fiance had a um, financial planner. And so, which also, again, God is just really, he, he be out here, God. Intentional, <laughs> intentional. So intentional. I used to always say, I cannot marry an entrepreneur. We're going to be dreaming and we're going to be poor. <laughs> um, but one thing that I absolutely loved about my fiance is like, he's an entrepreneur, he's a business owner. Um, and I think that it was inspiring to see, but also just a little bit intimidating, but it was kind of like I had a little bit of the blueprint. And so I went to our financial planner and was just like, hey, you know, I want to leave my job. And we had several conversations around like when I should transition and what were the perks financially, you know, like if I could retire or different things like that. And so it's like, mathematically, it made more sense for me to not try to retire. <laughs> It was like more time, but also have a plan on things that I wanted to operate as a business owner. And so I think a lot of times people think like, okay, I just want to make money, but I want to make money on top of having personal benefits. So my job had excellent insurance. We had um, health insurance, life insurance, 
disability insurance. Like these are all things that matter. And um, these are all things that cost money. And also depending on like the stage that you're trying to get them, this is what people don't talk about. Like trying to get, I didn't know that it was hard to get disability insurance like without a job. And so as we're setting up the plan, like our financial planner is saying like, this is when you will, you know, apply for your disability insurance. This is what your health needs to look like. Like these are the things. And so I told myself that I wanted to be able to transition my 401k to continue to grow retirement, have health insurance, life insurance, and disability insurance. That was priority to me. And I calculated what those numbers were on top of what I needed to do to maintain the business. Um, and then I went back and looked at my, you know, they give you like your benefits package and what the breakdown is. And so I was like, oh, I need to be able to translate what I'm doing over here into this, which is possible mathematically. <laughs> and so it's just not that easy <laughs> because, you know, like over here on your job, like this money is already set aside for you. And so it's like, how can I stay in this space long enough to build up a cushion, but also start to transition myself out of the role and different things like that. Um, and it was hard for me just mentally, like getting my mind into like, you have to leave the space. You have to leave the space. You have to leave the space because I was overworking myself and I wasn't able to see the results that I needed to see on my business because I just did not have the time. And so it's like, once you get to a space where you test it out and realize that it is possible, but this is what you have to give to get it. That was just really hard for me, challenging. Um, I mean, it was really hard for me mentally and it became so challenging like day to day to day. I would just find myself like just getting drained. And then sometimes I would start to ask myself, like, do I really want to do this? Like, I should stay on my job. Like, I'm getting married. You know, like, I don't want to stress my fiance out and we're planning a wedding and different things like this. And so then I start to say, I'm going to get another job. And I remember going to LinkedIn and I literally remember hearing God say, you just not going to do it my way. <laughs> you, you just not going to try out what I have already showed you, you know, works. Um, and that was the first time I realized that I was, I just did not have the faith that I thought I had in that particular space. Um, and I think that just comes from poverty mindset that comes from growing up without and like seeing family members transition from job to job and the impact of that like you do have a certain type of faith that exists but then when it comes to your finances it's like you have a this security bond that you're okay with that you're not able to relinquish to God just yet and I feel like when I did that it was like okay Ooh, you know, like, welcome to level two. <laughs> Girl, listen, you are literally preaching. I can 100% resonate with everything you're saying. What did, tell me, what did relinquishing that control over your finances look like? Because I, I think that that's something that many people struggle with. I struggle with it to this day. Like I go back and forth. Some days are good. Other days are like, you're a mess. Go to bed. Try again. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But like for you, what did that look like? Because I think one thing I can attest to needing to do was definitely rid the mindset of lack. Like you said, mindset of poverty, those are def definitely the same thing, but relinquishing control. Tell us, tell us about that. Oh yeah. I think that first it, it starts with um, submission, of course, to God, but then around the people and resources that he has given you. And so we talk about like God provides the vision and the provisions. And sometimes we only think of provisions in the dollar amount. And so when we think about what other provisions, you know, are around me that are accessible. And for me, number one, it was my fiance. Um, I have always been like, there's this little video on uh, Facebook and she's like me going to work to make just enough money so I can be an independent woman. <laughs> I have always been like, you know, I want to be able to have my own money. I want to be able to pay my own bills and do all of these different things. Um, and I think that my fiance, he's extremely selfless, right? But he also is like, what is the plan? You know, and that is that it wasn't so much of like the money. It was like, I don't want him to, you know, ask me questions about my plan and when I'm gonna do this and where I'm gonna do that. And, you know, because it creates a little bit of pressure and, and people think that I'm going to leave my job to get rid of pressure so that I can do what I want to do. And it's not true. 
And so we had this conversation with our financial planner and, you know, she was like, I think that you guys can do this. Like, I think that you can do this even if she doesn't have a job. Um, and then, you know, his question was, well, for how long? And um, she, she said, I'm not going to give you a timeline because most of the time when people have a timeline, at that very last moment, that is when you start to give up. That is when you start to not perform your best because you're already counting down the time. And I feel like having that mindset and then also knowing that I had the support of my fiance really made me think, okay, like I can just lay this all out on the table and there will be some low months. There will be some months where I will have to, you know, chime in for extra or I just won't have extra. Like what is your threshold, you know? Um, and just being okay with that. Like sometimes I'm okay with just having everything that I need. Um, and I know that like, no bill is unpaid, like nothing is undone. And I am making sacrifices for what I'm building. And I feel very content with that. No, definitely. I mean, I think that that's, that's what's most important. And that's also challenging within itself, mm -hmm. like finances, that's a whole nother conversation um, that we can dive into some other time. But I kudos to y'all number one for just going to the financial planner, but also for you just understanding like as long as you have what you need, like that is what matters most, you know? Right. Um, and then moving into the challenges of like outside of the personal challenges, what were, what would you say are like maybe business challenges that you face or have faced in this space with getting black to the lab off of the ground, moving products? Like I see you have a whole warehouse. I'm like, girl, I'm not even speaking that language. <laughs> Oh, so even again, having a warehouse, like I know sometimes I, tell, sometimes I think like, okay, if I didn't have a warehouse, this is money that I can save. But like, I want to, I want to start how I want it to go. And so I wanted to be sure that I could have a personal separation between my business and the life that I'm building because I have did the workaholic. I live with the work in my bed. I fall asleep with my computer. Like, um, and I just had so many conversations with my therapist around that. And even just like other women, it's just like, you have to be able to have a clear distinction. You have to be able to have clear boundaries. Like this is your family. And not only that, this is the family that you are creating and you get to set the terms and you get to build something. Um, but you have to be intentional. So I think some of my business challenges are around, uh, again, those provisions, like really the provisions. <laughs> I think um, I do. I did a lot of like pitching in the beginning. And so that helped me have some working capital in the beginning to kind of get everything started and get everything um on the roll because one thing that I wanted was I wanted black to the labs to be retail ready like I if target calls me today I'm ready um I knew that I needed a manufacturer I knew that I didn't want like the subscription boxes all of the products that I formulated and those are all things that I have built from for myself like literally the designing like putting the boxes together creating the products and I knew that I didn't want this to be like this because I felt like it was going to get in the way of me really like being able to push it and so finding a manufacturer was a little bit hard, but we did it. And so we got it. We got the product manufactured and it was like, okay, how are we going to get this shipped to us? And this is one of those moments where I talked about earlier about mentorship. Like I'm trying to ask everybody, like what you do, what you do, what you, but depending on what type of product you have, where you're manufacturing it from, like all of those things are different. So you really have to kind of go through it yourself. And I was in a pitch contest and I went and this was my second pitch contest. It was tons of businesses. Like, I think it was maybe like 20 of us pitching. Um, and I pitched and I was like, okay, like this is my product. I was so excited. And normally this is another like faith move. Typically I struggle with disappointment. And so sometimes I won't share like what I'm doing, like on the front end, just in case I get disappointed. I'm like, I need a little time to like let the disappointment sink in. <laughs> so this particular pitch contest, I was like, okay, well, you know, like I'm going to share with my followers, you know, like what I'm doing and different things like that. And I remember having the mindset of like, okay, like I can't lose, you know, like this is, I need this. At this particular moment, I need to win because I need this money. I need to be able to ship my product. And I had a quote for shipment for $18,000. Sounds bananas. 
<laughs> but I, I pitched and I did not win. And again, heart posture has to remain upright because your provisions are always near. And I remember this guy walking up to me afterwards and I don't know what made him, um, I, I guess he was just, I don't know if he was telling the information to everybody or what. But he's like, hey, I have this business here in Dallas. Um, he was like, uh, we sell health supplies, but we get a lot of shipment from overseas. And I may be able to um, extend you some resources just around like shipping and, you know, how to properly ship and just some resources that I have. He's like, I have trucks that take my products to the hospitals and fill orders. So we have trucks here, like just, you know, come out and I love to hear more about your business and how me and my wife can help in any way. And I was just like, people be lying. <laughs> Like, not heard, people be lying. I thinking like this man is not for real because what would be the reason? Like, what, what is right? Be, be for real. Come on, what are you gonna do? Like, what's please tell me. And I remember going. Um, I went to his company. He showed me his warehouse and everything. And I mean, no strings attached. He gets on the phone, calls his shipping company. He's like, "Hey, I have this small business. They're new to shipping. They're shipping from Taiwan. This is what they need. This is the shipment size. Can y'all do it?" And they were like, "Of course, for you." I'm in a room like, but again. Still, like, just having this, like, disbelief, like, too good to be true, too good to be true. And I was like, it's going to be some type of catch with it. Like, I don't know. And I remember calling the company and giving them all the information, connecting them with my manufacturing company. Do you want to know? These people said that it only cost $2,000. So that what is originally insane. $18,000 $18, turned into two, girl. Wow. Yeah. Turned into two thousand dollars. They they were exceptional. They got my shipment here, and I literally I was sharing like with my followers like I don't count that as a loss. Like I didn't lose that pitch competition. I won. I won exactly what I asked God for. Like absolutely that exact thing because that's what I needed the money for. I'm like I need to be able. To my product is ready. It is developed now. I just need to be able to get it to America. <laughs> So no, I'm, literally. So do you still use them as a shipping company today? Yes, I still use them as a shipping company. That is beautiful. And I, I'm also unfamiliar with like um, this process, but is it like a certain amount of or like what's the quantity, I guess, that they can ship? So this so the, the issue was that it, it wasn't big enough because a lot of companies, because of the um, shipping delays, like from the pandemic, they were only doing like full container shipments. So that means that like your product fills up the entire like truck bed. Um, but I needed a, you know, like a, a LCL, which is like just a little bit, you know, that means that I'm sharing space with some other product, which just creates like more risk and concern because it's like, okay, can this product be shit with this product or will it get cleared and all of these different things that I just didn't know. I'm like, where the regular shipping <laughs> But the more regular you get, like you get down to your DHLs, your FedEx, that's when it gets really expensive. Um, but just being able to go through a shipping company that manages your entire process, like getting it cleared through customs and all of these different things that I had no idea about. Like I would not have known where to start. They did all of that for $16,000 less. Wow. So shout out to the shipping company. Shout out to the man from the pitch <laughs> Mr. competition, Adrian. <laughs> Mr. Adrian, <laughs> because that is actually insane. And you know what? I'm just, like you said, God's provision is God's provision at the end of the day. Like when it's written, yeah. it's going to happen regardless of what we expect it to happen. And that's just beautiful. And it also makes me think about something you said earlier. That's when I was like, I don't know where I want to go with this. We have time. So I'm excited. You mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that you're currently in a season where you feel like you're exactly where you prayed to be. What is that season for you specifically? We want to know the prayer and we want to know how that came to fruition. Oh, the prayer is um, to be used by God, um, to be a tool fit for the master's use. Like that is the prayer to constantly be in action but also be in action on purpose and so I always use the quote like when passion and purpose 
um, collides because you can be on fire for the wrong things. Um, but to be on fire for what God designed you for is, is this little, this little tingle on the inside. It's just like, okay, like I feel good. I, I feel really, really good. And I know that I'm always taken care of in this space. Um, I've always just pray like, I want younger Kristen to be proud of who older Kristen is becoming, like becoming a wife, becoming a business owner who's not afraid to be a full-time business owner, becoming um, a change agent, like someone who's making impact and just always every, every single thing I do at every turn I make, like I'm doing it for black and brown girls. Oh my gosh, I absolutely love it. And it's some it's so interesting, something you also said earlier that I heard loud and clear, because I think I'm I'm in that space in life, um, is that you're okay with the assignment that God has given you. Mm-hmm. What would you say this assignment looks like in comparison to what you may have thought life would have unfolded or what, like how life would have been? Ooh, I, so I actually feel like the destination is the same, but the journey is different. Mm. Like That's beautiful within itself because you <laughs> yeah. said you could be on fire for the wrong thing and be looking crazy. Yes. But what about when you, you got, you got the, you're, you're in the ballpark, you're warm, but like, we just got to figure out now, what is that supposed to look like? Not in my eyes, but in God's eyes. In God's eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I remember I found a, um, a letter that I had written to uh, the Walmart foundation. I got a scholarship from the Walmart foundation and I was writing thank you letters. And in thank you letter, I kind of detailed like my why and my career path. And I used to always say that like, I wanted to be a pharmacist, but I wanted to be a pharmacist because I can make money. But I always wanted to use my money to make impact. And so I always thought that I had to have the money first. Like I had to be rich. Like, and it's just because that's how it was presented to us. Like the Oprah's and the Steve Jobs. And like, these are people who can afford to make impact. But when you're doing what God has called you to do, like your impact comes through him, like through the work that you are doing to glorify him. So you don't need to just be rich financially. Again, speaking of his provisions, like, it, it looks so different than just the dollar amount, like just to be rich with the fullness of the Lord and like just just being rich on those type of things, like for people to be able to see you in that aspect um, is inspiring in itself. Like if you are doing nothing else but giving God thanks, like that is inspiring in itself. So to be like on the right journey to still get to the same destination. Like I still think that I'm going to the same place, but the journey looks totally different. Like the people look different. Um, My commitment looks different. Uh, How I show up looks very different. Like how I feel today, like even though I said that I'm like, that I'm tired, I'm not, I'm not tired, you know, like sick and tired, (laughs) you know? So that looks, different because I do remember the days of like working myself into the ground like just working and working and working and working and just on this hamster wheel but when you center yourself on Christ first like everything else starts to align and it changes the how that journey feels to you on not just the outside but also the inside girl you better speak okay (laughs) because literally I'm just like number one loving it all but also it's it can be so difficult to navigate. And when you're not doing it alone, the load is so much lighter. Like, I don't care what anybody tells me. I was telling a friend the other day, we were just on the phone and I was like, it's so interesting because like, I'm not a super emotional person. Like I always joke and say, I cry like three times a year, you know? And like, that's (laughs) it. But I was on the phone and I was telling her like, it's hard right now. Like I'm in a season that is hard, but it's because I'm having to execute God's vision for my life. And it's Mm -hmm. not the most comfortable circumstance right now, but it doesn't feel hard. You know what I mean? Like how you just said, you just mentioned something earlier, um, similar to that. And it's like, because I know I'm not walking in my own strength. If it was my own strength, I would be hitting the ground the wall every single day, but knowing that like, I'm not doing it in my own strength. I think that it lightens a little bit, a little bit. So I, I just loved hearing you say that. Um, Cause yeah, we be having our own idea of what life is supposed to look like. I always tell people 
a similar story about how I had been, I had quit during the pandemic. I was looking for a new job and God just really had to reposition my heart posture because I wanted a new job to make X amount of dollars to do God knows what, like exactly. literally had no intention behind that. No intention truly um, outside of materialistic things, just to feed my ego, to feed the desire to not feel quote unquote poor, to not feel like I was lacking. You know what I mean? So it's like, just going through the process and allowing God to truly like, whether it be prune you or just like re rearrange your thinking, like your perspective, yes. it's just such a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. And I went to our church had a revival this year and the, the pastor said something and I'm not gonna lie when he first said it, I kind of turned my nose up a little bit. Oh, he ain't talking about me. <laughs> he was like, there is no such thing as a soft life when you are walking in God's purpose. Um, and I thought about that when you said like, look at me it, turning my nose up. Wait, <laughs> when he said, I was like, <laughs> baby, we're going to be soft <laughs> over <laughs> here. I was like, I don't know if God called that for me, but, um, uh, sign me up for the soft life. <laughs> but even like, again, like what you said, like it is hard, but it's a different type of hard. Like it is it, the hard that glorifies him and that in turn softens you. Like it, it reminds you that I am fed, that I am kept, that I am covered, that, that other people are interceding for me like that. I am doing this, not just with my strength alone, but with the strength of God. And so I think that is what he meant. And I, I when I say I turn my nose up so hard, I was like, mm, I don't know what that would talk, <laughs> but it's so true. It's true. Literally can't relate, but no, a hundred percent. Um, I listen, I, I am so excited for you. Mm. I cannot wait to witness all that you do. Tell us your vision for black to the lab. Like, of course, we'll get to how we can support, et cetera, et cetera. But what is your vision? So we have that ingrained in our minds. And so when it's time to turn up and to run a Target, because you know the Black the black women love Target, child. They can't stand Walmart. Yes. But apparently Target is the place to be. But what what's your vision? How can we, you know, how can we make sure we are supporting that vision? Oh, wow. So I think our long, long-term vision is really to impact black and brown girls early enough so that they can pursue their version of still. Um, that we don't have to be forced into this box where we are the minority being just directed by the ebbs and flows of what is happening around us, but that we can shape our, ac our own academic experiences, right? And so that means that if I want to do my research on the effectiveness of edge control, I can do just that. <laughs> um, like, that and it's still academic that when we go into these spaces again changing our mind from consumer to producer because if we are want to talk about creating things for black women think about creating things for black women by black women so that black women are not just the byproduct or that the industry is not shaping what black people think that they want which we know is hard to do um because we tell the people what we want, but do we benefit from it? Um, so that's that's kind of our goal is like really creating this super engaging academic experience that goes from hands-on learning activities to be able to incorporate technology. Um, in our activations, when we go to schools, we also talk to the students about business and the entrepreneurship side of it. And because the industry is so wide, it's like, okay, I may not formulate, but I may be on branding and marketing, you know, like I may be on the engineering side, like engineering the different cool packaging and bottles and different things that make these brands super unique. Um, so like so many components of that, like that is our long-term goal to shift from hands-on to tech, more activations, just really getting out there, making sure that the product and the education and the tools around it are extremely accessible. Um, and then of course, retail, like retail is our big goal and not to just have products, but my long-term vision, if anybody steals this, I'm putting it in the atmosphere because I know that God is going to protect it, but people be stealing. <laughs> but my long-term goal is that we can impact girls, but then also bring them in to create like their own products. That is something that I would really, really love to do because think about like giving a young girl an opportunity to see something that they created on the shelf. So again, not just 
you know, buying Black to the Lab, but being able to create and produce for Black to the Lab too. So, so exciting. Uh, it actually yes. so big when I say it, it like makes me sweat inside. But the, I'm just like, oh Lord. But I know that he's going to do the thing. Yes. And it's, listen, it's so possible. Um, so beautiful, so attainable. So we're, we're going to, we're going to do whatever we can to make it happen. Lastly, let us know where can the people find you? Where can the people purchase Black to the Lab for their little loved ones? Like, again, I want to make sure that we are fully supporting you and we're on the Kristen train. Yes. So um I'll share some good news that I don't think that I have shared yet with my followers but not only can you find Black to the Lab at blacktothelab.com and support and purchase our products and share it with all your little people you can also engage with us online to book um in class activations we are now booking our summer activations so if you have an organization or a small group or a large group um, that you would like to participate in the Black to the Lab activations, you can shoot us an email, but also officially you can find us on Amazon.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amazon Prime delivery today. Yeah, you can shop us on Amazon.com, which is super exciting. Uh, we've been working on that for a long time um, and through the help of the Amazon team, uh, we've really been able to really bring this to life. So that's the first time I'm saying it out loud because I'm like, I want it to be perfect. But alas, <laughs> you can literally type in black to the lab and it's the first thing that comes up, which is wild. Um, but that is how you can support us. And then of course, continuing to share our content and engage with our upcoming events. So, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for being here. Um, Thank you for everyone listening in. This is not the last that you will see or hear from Kristen. Um, and I can't wait. I can't wait to witness all you do. So thank you again for joining the show. Um, thank you for having me. Of course. Absolutely. If you're listening in until next episode, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.